Hey, welcome to 49cc Scoot. My name's Brent, and today I'm going to be doing one of my favorite parts of any engine build, which is the cylinder kit. I'm also going to do some checks along with that. I'm going to install the reed valves, and I will make sure it is leak free. While we're looking at all these pretty parts here, I want to say before you get started with anything, you should do a thorough inspection of everything when you unbox it. I did an unboxing video and if you watch that you've already seen this, but I found a whole lot of burrs on this cylinder head. Some people have found little chunks of metal left over from threading. There's all sorts of things that could be wrong here, hopefully not, but a lot of this is just tiny little stuff where you just deburr it and you'll never have to worry about it, but definitely do that that will reduce your likelihood of having any kind of foreign debris, any sort of metal inside your engine, which obviously you don't want. The first part that I'm going to give some attention to is the piston ring. I'm not actually installing the piston ring yet, but I'm trying to get pre-assembly checks out of the way, and piston ring end gap is a very important one. Piston ring end gap, or piston ring clearance, is simply the gap between the ends of the piston ring. So when this is installed in the cylinder, these are going to be compressed together much closer to each other. What we want to do is measure what that gap is inside of the cylinder, which I'll show you in a minute. But our goal is to set this to a spec because we want to totally avoid these butting up against each other. When these are in the cylinder, if those butt up against each other, it's a very bad thing. You need some clearance there because everything expands under heat and you don't want the engine to get hot and then they start to butt up against each other. The ring is going to dig into the cylinder wall and cause nothing but trouble. To check the end gap, you'll need to compress the piston ring a little bit and insert that into the cylinder. We want this to end up five or six millimeters from the top, the deck here, but for now I'm going to push it down a little bit further. Now I'm going to take my piston and insert that in the bottom of the cylinder and push that up. So I'm going to push it up right until it's up against the bottom of the ring. I'll continue to push the ring up the bore until I'm about five to six millimeters from the top. Now I'm done with my piston so I can remove it. It's important to use the piston to push the ring in the bore because otherwise the piston can be crooked, tilted a little bit, and if it is, one of these ends may be sitting a little higher or lower than the other, or the ring is not compressed the way it should be, and your reading of this gap will be inaccurate. I'm going to measure the gap using feeler gauges, and Melosi says that this gap should be 0.15 millimeters, or at least a minimum of 0.15 millimeters. Now my feeler gauges are standard first, so I don't have a 0.15, but I have a 0.152, which is a six thousandths of an inch thick feeler gauge. So that's where it should end up. That doesn't mean it's where it's going to start. So what you'll try to do is take your feeler gauge, obviously put it sideways, and you're going to basically use this as a go or no go. It's either going to fit between there or it's not. If it doesn't fit, then this gap is too small. In my case, this isn't going to fit in there. So you don't want to put a bunch of pressure on it and force it, because if you try to force it, then you're just going to separate the rings. It'll end up that one of them will move a little bit, and if that happens, then you've got to get the piston back in there and reset it. All that really matters is that I don't have sufficient clearance, but just for curiosity's sake, I'm going to measure and see if I can figure out what the gap is or close to it. So this is a five thousandths of an inch, or 0.127 millimeters. and that fits. So it's very close. The gap is somewhere around 0.13 millimeters, maybe a little larger, but it's not 0.15. So there's not a whole lot of work to do here. Now I'm going to remove the piston ring from the bore because I need to modify it. You could use your piston to push this out, but it's really easy just to kind of tilt it and compress it and pull it out of there. To make filing the piston ring as easy as possible, I've got a diamond file supported in a vise. And what I'm going to do is run the piston ring across the file instead of running the file across the piston ring. When working with piston rings, you don't just file them however you feel like until you get the right gap. You actually need to know a few things. So number one, one of the most important things is these piston rings have a coating on the outside edge. These are a chrome coating. There are different types. But usually there's a thin coating on the outside edge of the piston ring and you don't want to damage that or cause it to flake off. So because of that, when you're filing, you want to file from the outside of the piston ring in. So you're always pushing this way. 
If you push this way, you're at a greater risk of damaging that coating and causing it to flake off. Another thing that you need to know is that you want to keep the ends of this piston ring as flat and as parallel to each other as possible. So when they butt together, you want them to butt together very flat. You don't want to find that you've filed one crooked and that there's a big gap on one side. Also, when you look at the ends of these piston rings, you can see that they're not just totally flat. In this case, they have cutouts in them. They're notched out so that they can go around that locator pin. So what I'm going to do is when I file, I'm going to squeeze both ends together against the file and drag it across just the one direction like I said and that would create an even gap. Now in some cases people advise to only file one side but again because of these little cutouts here it keeps everything totally even if you file them that way. In my opinion it's up to you because when you're talking about 0.01 or 0.02 millimeters maybe a thousandth of an inch there you're not going to change it enough either way put it off center enough that it actually matters in most cases you'll still have plenty of clearance there for the uh, locator pin. Now one argument some people make for just filing one side is that it's easier to do one side flat than it is to do both um, because then you have a reference you can push them together and you can see how flat they sit but for me if I put them against the file and push it together and drag it against the file that way then I should be creating a pretty parallel surface. And one more time the most important thing to remember here is to file from the outside edge to the inside. We do not want to damage this coating. So in the case of having the file supported this way, outside to inside, I'm going to push this way. And I'm only going to push this one way. So what I'll do is I'll take both of the ends of the piston ring, butt them together kind of lightly on there, and then push this way. And I'll give it a couple of strokes. I clean the piston ring off real quick with compressed air just so I don't carry any debris into the cylinder and I'm not measuring against any debris. And now I've got it set up in the cylinder just like I did before, nice and level, and I'm going to use my six thousandths of an inch or .152 feeler gauge and see if that fits or not. And that still doesn't fit, so I need to file a little bit more. It seemed like it was really close to me, so I'm just going to give it one more pass. Real quick. Once again, the ring was cleaned and set up in the bore, and now I can do another check. And now that fits in there. I think I just moved my ring, but I can reset it real quick. Let's give it a double check. And that does indeed fit now. Anytime you file a piston ring, you want to make sure it's deburred. And also, Melosi provides the instructions here to create a 45 degree chamfer here on each end of the piston rings they say it should be 0.2 millimeters. So 0.2 millimeters is incredibly tiny. I can tell you I looked at this thing with a magnifying glass before I started just to see what they had and I couldn't tell there was really any chamfer there. But just go in there and try to make sure that you at least bevel that edge lightly and give it a real close look. Again get a magnifying glass out if you need to and make sure everything is smooth and parallel here. I'm going to use this lapping hone and stone here to finish this off. So again, you want to file from the outside in at a 45 degree angle, just one direction on each edge here to try and create that little chamfer. And I'm not going to do much, just a couple of quick passes. And I'm going to call that good. And again, also, I'm going to get my magnifying glass out and I'll look over it real quick and make sure I don't see anything jagged or rough. In addition to looking for burrs, make sure you butt the ends together and be sure that they are butting together flat or parallel. That looks pretty good to me, so I'm going to take this in, just wash it off with some soap and water, and then thoroughly dry it, and it'll be ready to go. While I'm thinking about it, I wanted to mention that I did prep this piston a little bit. Basically just went around and removed all the sharp edges here on the piston skirts. If you want more info on that, it is in the end of the part 3 porting video for the RC1 series. Before I go any further, I want to say a big thank you to the folks at ScooterTuning.ca. They hooked me up with a discount, and honestly, without them, I probably wouldn't be doing this RC1 project. So again, thank you to those guys. Also, if you've never heard of them, make sure you look them up. 
Go check out their site. They've got a lot of scooter parts, a lot of high performance stuff for two strokes and four strokes. And even though they're in Canada, if you're in the US, don't worry about it because everything for me has been faster than most of the people I deal with in the US and cheaper on shipping. I have no idea how they do it, but it's great. So again, go ahead and check out scootertuning.ca. Melosi supplies five different base gaskets with this kit and each one is a different thickness. So we need to figure out which one we want to use before we assemble the engine. So we've got to do a bit of pre-assembly. And the reason for this is because we want to figure out the squish clearance and try to get it to spec. So if you're unaware, squish clearance is basically the clearance between the piston crown here and your combustion chamber, the squish area in the cylinder head. So Melosi says that this should be 0.55 to 0.6 millimeters of clearance. So what we'll need to do is a bit of a mock-up using the medium gasket to start with. We'll check the squish with that and then the number that we get from that will tell us where we need to go with the other gaskets to achieve the proper squish. Now I would have thought that since they supply all these gaskets they would have told me what the thicknesses are somewhere in the manual. If it's in there I didn't see it. So I sat down and measured them myself with a micrometer and what I got was starting with a gold which is the thinnest that is 0 0.05 millimeters. 0.1 millimeter, 0.15 for the medium. I got 0.21 millimeters for this one, and the thickest is 0.3 millimeters. It wouldn't be a bad idea to take your own measurements just in case something was off in a manufacturing run or if maybe the kits vary in the future. But just from handling these, you can actually tell the difference. So once I know what the designations are, obviously this one's gold, but you can feel the difference in this one's clearly thinner than this one is and this one's thicker than that one and so on. So you can feel it, just write those down and you'll know which is which just by handling them. First part of my mock-up assembly is going to be to install the cylinder studs. All those are just going to go in there finger tight and hopefully they will go all the way in until they stop near the center section, the uh, unthreaded section. If you haven't seen my pre-assembly videos then you should check those out because I did go over the threads in there. In my case, the threads on the studs and in the cases weren't in the best shape. Um, they weren't bad, but these should be able to go in just finger tight, and I would have had to have double nutted these to install them. So I went over them with uh, tap and die. I don't have a thread chaser for 7mm, and took care of it. Now I need to put my wrist pin bearing in the connecting rod, and while this is just a mock-up, I'm still going to squirt a little bit of oil in there and I'll go ahead and slide this through and rotate that around. Now I need to install the piston and the wrist pin and I wouldn't necessarily have to install the circlips in there because this is just a mock-up and it's not going to run. I'm just going to rotate it over by hand but I'm actually kind of excited to play with sort of a new toy. So I got this thing which is called the C-Clipper made by Bucks Tools. And it claims that it can install C-clips, the circlips, in there very easily every time and very quickly. Now, this isn't a necessity by any means. You can absolutely get these in by hand. But I can say that no matter how many times I've put these things together, I never enjoy trying to get the circlip in. Some people can just take it with their hands, their fingers, and push it in there, maybe with a little help of a screwdriver to get it the last way. I normally would use pliers and grab it like needle nose pliers, grab it and kind of twist it in. But I was excited at the idea that maybe a tool would make it super easy, super fast, and maybe no more circlips would ever go flying across the garage again. So I'm going to install at least one of these now and check it out. The tool is made up of three pieces. There's the sleeve, that's the metal piece here, and the clip is actually going to go all the way through it and come out the end here, hopefully into the clip groove. So this little machined end here will go into the piston and you set it up. This adapter allows you to set it up so it stops right when the end of this is just behind the clip groove inside of the piston. And with the adapter you can set it up the same way quickly and easily every time if you have multiple pistons that are the same. Then this piece, the installer, basically pushes it in. You set the circlip on the end here and you can see that it will compress because of the way it's designed so it can compress through there and they claim that you can just push it right through and once it comes out the end of this sleeve then it should pop right into the groove. 
So we'll see. I will tell you that when this came out of the box, I threaded the sleeve in and out of the adapter a little bit, and it was creating some fine shreds of plastic here from this adapter. So I did that a few times until it stopped. And then I took it all the way out and put a little bit of two-stroke oil on the threads because it was kind of tough to move. I have also preset this, hopefully, to the right depth. When you look at the adapter, you can see there's an angled edge and a straight 90-degree edge here. So they call this the mitered edge, and they say this should be on the side of the arrow that the arrow is facing. So when you put this in, this angled edge is going to be just like this on the same side as the arrow. And once you've got it set up, you should be able to just push this in. And I will say it's fairly tight there. It's not an easy fit. If you've got it set up properly, you should see that the end of this sleeve is just shy of reaching the circlip groove. So it should be basically right on the edge of it. Now for me, I find this pretty difficult to see. I'll probably be able to see it better once I look at the video on a big screen than I can now. But I think that's set up about right. Now the sir clip needs to be installed onto the end of this tool. When you look at this tool, you should see that there are multiple grooves. There's four grooves around there, but only one groove has two dots on each side of it. And those two dots correspond with this line. So you compress this a little, put your clip on there, and align the end of the clip with those two dots in that groove there. Then when you install this, you know where the opening in your clip is because you have this line and then you can put the opening wherever you want it. You don't want the opening in the clip to wind up here by this groove because then you won't be able to easily remove that clip later just by putting something in there and popping it out. And also, generally you don't want the opening facing up or down on the piston here. You would like it to be facing in the direction of the travel of the connecting rod. And what they say is that the force of this moving up and down and stopping and starting can actually compress it enough that it starts to compress that clip and it could pop out. But if you face it this way, so the opening is either this way or this way, that's not an issue. So for me, the easiest way is going to be to try and align that opening right here in the front of the piston. So all I need to remember is that I need this line facing forward on the piston. I'm going to put this back in there. and make sure that's all the way seated. You can see why this guide is handy. You can set it there, and then you can kind of look down through there again and just double check that it is where you thought it should be. And allegedly, as long as I align this properly, it should be as easy as just pushing this in, and that should go in place. And I will say they did tell me in the instructions that you should have a little bit of two-stroke oil or oil inside of there to make it easier to push this in. So I'm just going to set it upright. Again, I remember that I wanted my opening facing this way. So I'll put the line facing this way and start to insert this tool. And hopefully it's just going to pop in. They do say to use easy, steady pressure. Don't try to tap it. So I'm going to take a look from the other side and see what's going on, if I can tell. And I can't really tell anything yet, so I'm just going to keep pushing, making sure this line is facing the top of the piston. And was that it? No, not quite. There it goes. Okay, I'm feeling a pop, so I'm hoping that's it. And here's how it looks from the other side. So it appears that that clip should be seated in there, and I can now remove the tool. So I'm going to see if this will just pull out of here, which it does easily, and then this should just pull out of the side of the piston. I suppose you should be careful because if that clip is not seated, then it may be flying out of there, it's possible. As you can see, it's pretty snug like I said before, there it goes. Looks great to me. It's installed in the groove. The opening is right where I'd want it, right up here. And there isn't a scratch on the piston that I can see from using it. I want to be 100% clear that there is no sponsorship involved with this. I didn't get a discount. I didn't get anything. The people that made this tool have no idea who I am or that I'm doing this. So I just saw it online. I thought it was a really cool thing. As I said, I've never really enjoyed installing circlips. If there's an easy way to do it, 
This thing costs $45. I thought, why not give it a shot? So I'm really happy with it. The only real downside that I can think of at the moment, assuming it continues to work this well, is that it only works for one size. So this is a 13 millimeter version of the tool. And for most of the stuff I own, I would also need a 12 millimeter version, but I might actually go out and buy it if it continues to work this well, because this is pretty neat for the price. I'm gonna put a little bit of oil in here inside of the wrist pin bore. This is two stroke oil, same stuff I'll use in the engine, by the way. And I've also got a little bit on the wrist pin and I'm gonna just kinda move that around a little bit, get it spread out. Then I'll push that through till it's basically flush with the inside of the piston. Now I'm gonna take the piston with the arrow on the crown facing down toward where the exhaust port will be. And I'm gonna align the pin with the connecting rod and the bearing and slide that pin through. The pin should be pushed all the way in up against the circlip that was just installed. Again, I don't really have to install the circlips at this point, but I don't really see any reason that I'm going to have to remove this piston again. And I kind of want to play with the tool again. So I'm going to go ahead and put the one in this side as well. Same process. Now I'm going to stuff a rag here around the connecting rod in the crankcase. It doesn't seem like the clip is going to go flying off, but just in case it does, I don't want that inside of the engine. And definitely if you're doing this by hand, make sure you stuff some rags in there. So again, this angled edge is going to face the arrow and I'm going to push this in all the way until this adapter stops it. Put my circlip on here with the opening by the groove with the dots in it. So I'm going to go ahead and start pushing this in, paying attention to where that line is. And I'm going to go ahead and push and hopefully it'll click in place. Sounded good, so let's see what happened. And it did a good job again. Opening is right here at the top where I wanted it. And it's nicely installed in that groove without a scratch. You don't need to worry about the piston ring for a mock-up. So I'm going to go ahead and install my base gasket now. Then... I'm going to put a little bit of two-stroke oil inside the cylinder. Don't need a whole lot for this. And just smear it around. And I'm going to make sure my exhaust port is facing toward the ground or down. And the piston's really easy to put in because there's no ring in there. So I can just slide this right on over the piston and align the holes in the base with the studs. Now I can get the supplied nuts started on the studs and I'm going to go in a crisscross pattern. So I'm going to start this one up here in this corner Then I'll go down to this corner and get one started and snugged up just by hand. And you go to an opposite corner of that and then the final one. Now I'm going to use a 10 millimeter wrench and just lightly snug these again. Same crisscross pattern. The next step for me was supposed to be torquing these cylinder studs, but this is proving to be more difficult than I expected. So I knew that a socket is not gonna work on here. This is a quarter inch socket, pretty small, pretty thin walls, not even close. I knew that it wouldn't be as easy as a socket and I thought I was prepared with flare nut wrenches. So these things are designed so you can put your torque wrench in here or an extension and then this should go over a hard to reach nut like this and you would be able to torque it. But in this case the ends here are too wide and too long so they just run into the cylinder. I can't even get it started on there let alone turn it. So I'm going to have to figure this out and the best thing I can figure I really don't want to go and buy another set of these so I'm probably just going to see if I can grind the end down and grind all this. I mean it kind of sucks because it's sort of going to ruin this tool. It's going to take all the chrome coating off there and it's plus it's work I didn't want to do. But if it works for the RC1 then I guess it'll be worth it.
I had to thin that out considerably and I'll put a little before and after here to make it clear. But it appears that this should work now. So now I can use an extension in there and then I should be able to torque these all to 13 newton meters. Now I need to cut a piece of solder that's around a millimeter in diameter. It should be at least a millimeter, but not too much more. And it needs to be about a millimeter shy of the bore size or a little more. Melosi says one to one and a half. So I'm gonna cut it about 50.85. That's just where the calipers landed. That was close enough for me. And one thing about doing squish checks, it can be confusing if you don't cut the ends off totally flat because you may think how you cut it is showing where it's squished, so make sure to cut it totally flat and square. And the easiest way to do that is just to take a razor knife and plunge it down on top of it. Right there. And I'm just going to push straight down. Now I've put a piece of Gorilla Tape on there and I'm going to tape it across this way, trying to get really centered all the way around there. and it should be going along with the axis of the piston pin. So not from exhaust port to boost port, but across this way. I'll rotate this around just enough to get that piston off of top dead center. That'll give me some clearance to make sure I'm not running into it while I'm trying to install the head. And the head is two piece. There's a cover and the head itself. You do not need this cover. All we're trying to do is check squish. And when this is installed, you should see it's got Melosi up here. That's going to go toward the top. And it's these bolts, these M6 by 1.0 Allen head bolts that should be supplied with the kit. And I'll snug these down just like everything else in a crisscross pattern. And I guess I should mention I'm also not using any gaskets. You don't need the O-rings and stuff to do a squish check. And then they all get torqued to 11 Newton meters. I'm going to need to turn the engine over a few times, so I'll put a nut on the crankshaft. You should have had nuts supplied with the crankshaft. When you're looking at it over here, the engine is usually rotating counterclockwise, but just to make it easier, I'm gonna rotate the engine clockwise because that way I'm tightening the nut on here. I don't have to worry about it coming off. It really doesn't matter. And I'm just gonna turn it around at least four or five revolutions of the engine. And I can feel it's either the nut tightening or, no, there we go. About the top of the bore, and then you'll feel a little bit each time. It's two, three, four, now I can barely feel it, and five. Now all the bolts can be removed, and you should actually remove them in a counterclockwise pattern, or at least just release the tension on them in a counterclockwise fashion. Rotate the piston back up to the top of the bore. It has indeed squished the solder on each end, so I can remove my tape and take the solder off there so I can measure it. Now I'm going to measure both ends with a set of calipers, and you want to be careful when you measure this. You don't want to try to squash it down too much, put too much pressure on there, or you could squish this even more and affect your measurement. But I'm going to do multiple measurements on each end and try to find the thinnest spot. So 0 0.52, 0 0.53, 5, 6 toward that end. So it looks like 0 0.52 on that side. Check the other side. Now I've got 0 0.58, 0 0.59. 
0 0.58, 0 0.6, 0 0.57. So 0 0.57 on one side and 0 0.52 on the other. As long as you know the squish clearance that you want, it's pretty easy to decide on gasket thickness from here. So in my case, I'm going to go with Melosi's spec of somewhere between 0.55 and 0.60 for minimum squish clearance. And I know that I have a 0.15 millimeter thick gasket. My current measured minimum squish clearance is 0.52 millimeters. So I need to go up at least 0.3 millimeters and I have a gasket that is 0.21. So it's about 0.06 thicker. So that should be the perfect choice for me. It should put me at around 0.58 for minimum squish clearance. If you'll be switching gaskets, you have a few options here. The first would be to take the current gasket out, put in the gasket that you anticipate to work based on calculations, and then recheck the squish. Another option would be not to even check the squish again and just assume that it's going to work. It really should because if you've done your measurements accurately and your calculations, everything should be correct. Or what I'm going to do is I'm going to carry on and I will assemble the engine later with the anticipated gasket and then before it's all done I'll check the squish but I'll probably go ahead and actually assemble that with my sealant on the base gasket and everything because it really should be right and I'll check the squish and if something's wrong from there I can adjust but I really don't anticipate that anything is going to be a problem. Before removing the cylinder and the current gasket, I wanted to do a check with a degree wheel to see what the exhaust and transfer durations are, at least roughly. I expect Melosi's numbers to be accurate, but it never hurts to check, and honestly, I kind of enjoy using a degree wheel. To be as accurate as possible with the numbers that I'm going to see, I should actually switch out the gasket to the one that I'll use, because base gasket thickness will affect duration. However, 0.06 millimeters of gasket thickness is going to have a very tiny effect, so this will be close enough for me. I'm just showing you a quick montage here. I'm not going through the whole degree wheel setup with you because I have other videos dedicated to degree wheel setup and you really need to go into a little bit of detail with that. So if you're interested, please check those out. Now that the degree wheel is set up, I'll be able to rotate my engine around and by seeing when the piston is just starting to uncover a port, then I can tell what the timing is on the ports. So what I'll do is put a light underneath of the exhaust port for now. If you can get a little light shining up there, it helps to uh, see the opening a little better. I'm going to rotate this around and I'm going to try to stop right where I just start seeing some light coming through the exhaust port. It's probably hard to see on here, but I do like to be clear of any chamfers on there and make sure I'm actually seeing the exhaust port itself. So it's open just a tiny bit when I check. Everybody has their own way of doing this. My way may not be 100% correct, but I think most of us would struggle with accuracy down to some fine part of a degree anyway. Now I'll take a look at my degree wheel, and it appears that it is about 195 degrees of duration. I'll rotate this around again and come to the same spot, and then check my degree wheel again. The exhaust duration appears to be 195 degrees for me, and Melosi claims 195.5. I will mention that I'm basically measuring off of one side of the exhaust port that's opening before the other one. So over here, if I'm looking more straight down on it than the camera is, I'm seeing the light come through here, just seeing it come through. And over here, I can't see any light coming through yet when I'm at this angle. I'm going to have to move this about there is where I can finally start seeing light come through here and this one is actually open more than I'd want. And if I look at my degree wheel now, it shows me about 194 degrees for this one. So it appears to me that there's about a one degree mismatch of the openings here. Now I'm gonna switch my light up here where the reed block would be and shine it down in there. It may be able to put a little light up through the transfers, maybe not, we'll see. Then I use the same process for the transfers. Now there are a whole bunch of transfers, so it's up to you if you want to check every one if you're going to do this. I'm not worried about every single transfer, I'm just trying to get an idea of when most of them seem to be opening. So right about there, hopefully you'll see some light on the video. And that appears to be 130 degrees, or at least very close to it, which is Melosi's spec. And again, I'll rotate it around, check the same number on the other side, and you can look around at all the other ports and see if they're different if you'd like. The other thing that I'll do, which I don't really need the degree wheel for, 
but since it's here I'll rotate this around the bottom dead center because now I want to see where exactly the piston sits at bottom dead center. I'm seeing what I expected based on the pre-assembly checks that I showed in the porting video and at bottom dead center there is definitely a mismatch here of the roof or the crown of the piston and the port floor. I'm going to try and take a measurement and see if I can tell with some better accuracy what the actual mismatch is. So I'm going to measure to the edge of the piston crown right up to the deck here and see what that is. And then when I take the cylinder off, then I'll be able to measure from the deck of the cylinder down to the floor of the transfer and see what the difference is. So that looks like 43.95 millimeters. Now I can go ahead and remove my degree wheel and remove my cylinder, and then I'll take that measurement of the cylinder. I'm trying to measure in the same spot as straight on as I can get this. I got 45.9. I'm gonna do it at least a couple more times. 45.8. 45.87 so 45.8 to 45.9 I'm not going to claim that these are the most accurate measurements ever but I think they should be reasonably close and it looks like a little shy of two millimeters about 1.9 millimeters of mismatch there between the piston crown at bottom dead center and the floors of the transfers so even if I put the gasket in there that's 0.06 millimeters thicker that's really not going to change much of anything and that's a lot of mismatch. Now I mentioned this at the end or near the end of the uh, porting video that I did and my understanding has always been that you want the roof, the piston crown, the edge of the piston crown to be basically flush or level with the floors of the transfers when the engine is at bottom dead center. And that does a couple of things. One, it kind of matches up the crown to the floor and creates a nice flow path so you don't create a bunch of turbulence and it's also supposed to provide better cooling for the piston but Bravo 1412 commented and said that you actually wanted the turbulence there you wanted that mismatch to create some turbulence and to better cool the piston crown now I don't follow all the latest two-stroke tech. Basically, by the time I do the video stuff, either working on the scooters and then doing the video stuff as well, and then being on the forum and so on, it's pretty much my entire life. So I don't really feel like then trying to read everything from everybody else. What can I say? I know I should, but I just don't. However, I happen to know someone that does follow everything two-stroke related. So 190 Mech, his name is John but he goes by 190 mech on the 49ccscoot.com forums. I've known him for many years on forums um, and actually met him in person, but uh, he has been an avid two-stroke fan, builder, tuner, and I believe he raced, I think he said back in the 70s, so he's been at this a long time, and I mean, he follows this stuff closely. This, he really is into two-strokes, big time. Um, incredibly smart guy, aircraft mechanic, uh, yeah. Anyway, so I talked to him because I knew he would have an idea if there were some other theories out there uh, about creating turbulence and the mismatch there, and I wanted to see what he would say. And he basically told me that just all you've got to do is follow all the big guys in two-stroke tuning that are willing to share things. So he follows people like Jan Thiel, uh, Fritz Overmars, I believe his name is Wayne Wright, he goes by Wobbly. People like that that have dedicated literally their entire lives to two-stroke tuning. These guys have a lot of dyno time, a whole lot of uh, building and racing time. You know, uh, Jan Thiel and Fritz Overmars developed the RS-125 uh, for Aprilia. So big names here, they know what they're talking about. And he says that Jan Thiel directly said that you don't want to mismatch there. You actually want the transfers to be flushed with the piston at bottom dead center. Uh, so you're not creating turbulence and so that the mixture can better attach itself to the piston for better cooling. So for me that's all I need to know. I think that the Melosi setup is probably not ideal the way it is. However, I've seen people with shops that build a bunch of these and people that have dynos 
and they're putting these things together with very minimal port matching at best. Some of them didn't appear that they even touched the cases to do any port matching. And so I have to imagine they're probably not bothering to check bottom dead center and all that. They probably just do the switch check and move along. And it's not like these things aren't still wheelie monsters and making tons of horsepower. So I think it's all right, ideal or not. I previously matched the thickest gasket in this set to my cylinder and to the cases. And basically it's just that the boost port on the edges here, the gasket hangs over a little bit. Otherwise, it was pretty close and I needed to match everything to the gasket. But I have not done any of the other gaskets, so this is the one I need to use, the one that's 0.21 millimeters thick. So I just need to match that up real quick and I'm just going to file these edges until they match the cylinder. I got that matched up, went around, checked everything else just to be sure it still looked good. Now I'm going to take the cylinder and the gasket, I'm going to go wash those with soap and water, and then I'll dry them off thoroughly with compressed air. And before I get back to it, I'll clean off my workspace to make sure I don't have any aluminum debris there. I've got a little more prep to do here, so I am going to go ahead and install my exhaust flange. Now it's just easier while I can get to it this way. And I've already matched this up or made sure it's matched up mostly, it was actually a pretty good match. Uh, right from the start, but I know that I can put the bolts in here loosely, move this around, find the spot where it matches the best, and then tighten it down. But before I do that, there's an O-ring that goes on the back of here. There's actually two O-rings for this flange. One goes here, and one goes around here to help seal the pipe. I'm not going to put the one on for the pipe right now. I'll probably just go ahead and put this with my other exhaust stuff, and I'll do that when I actually install the exhaust. So I'm just going to do this one. And before that goes on there, I'm going to give it just a really light coating of grease. When this goes on, it's got two extra holes here. Those are for the exhaust springs. So you need those to face up toward the top of the cylinder. Now the bolts are still a little bit loose. I got a little bit of play in there. So just going to use my finger. I can feel around the edges and I can tell where this matches up the best. And once I get it to that point, then I can tighten these bolts down. I don't have any published torque spec for these, so I'm just going to get them fairly tight. I'm not going to overdo it because this is going into aluminum. And as you can see, crisscross pattern. I also want to prep the cylinder head cover a little bit because there are a few things to go in there. The first thing is going to be right here on the side there is a bolt hole and this little bolt should be supplied with a kit. It's basically a bleed screw but you also have to look in the gasket kit because there should be a little washer that goes right underneath of that. Put that on there and then I will get this in there snug to tight. It's another thing I don't have a torque spec for. There's this hole right here. There is a plug for this and there's also an o-ring that will match up to this plug to go in there. So you can use that or if you're using a coolant temperature sensor you're probably going to put that in there. Now my coolant temperature sensor is actually in the scooter right now on the cylinder head that's on it. So I'm going to wait until I see if I'm actually swapping this out or not if I can make it to the car show but I'm just going to leave this open right this second. So the other thing is this big port right here and that is for the coolant port. So this is another one where you have to look in your gasket kit and you should have this big aluminum ring that will go onto the bottom of there and then you can thread this into the head. This has a hex inside, it's 12 millimeters, so you either need a large hex socket or you can use probably an 8 millimeter bolt that has a 12 millimeter hex head and grab that some way like vice grips or double nut and tighten this down. Again, don't have a torque spec on this, just get it tight. I'm getting ready to start the installation, so I need to put my piston ring on the piston. Again, this has already been gapped, 
if you're skipping around in the video or something, it's very important to gap this. So go back in the video, look at the beginning, and I'll talk about ring end gap. Now, some people like to just put these on. You can basically just start it on here and sort of bend it around. I've always preferred the tool. The tool's really cheap and makes it super easy. Two things to be aware of. Number one, there's writing here on the piston ring. That indicates the top of the piston ring. This will face up. The other thing is this gap here in the end will need to be aligned with this locator pin in the ring groove. Okay, so we've got the numbers facing up. I'll put this down in there. I'm only going to squeeze this as much as I have to to get it over top of the piston. You don't want to break a ring. You can see that the ring is aligned with the locator pin now and that allows me to squeeze this ring, compress it so that it is totally flush with the sides of the piston. Another thing you may want to do while you're here is just make sure that you do have sufficient clearance. The ring should not feel like it's sticking in this groove. It should be able to turn pretty easily. For me, you've already seen that I have installed both circlips here, wrist pins in there, the bearings in there, and everything's oiled. If you haven't done all that stuff, make sure it's complete before you continue. I'm going to go across my studs real quick. Just make sure they're still in there, at least finger tight. If you'd like to, you can remove these studs and put some Loctite on the side that goes into the cylinder. The gasket's going to be the next step for me, and I don't want my piston lying right on the gasket because I'm going to have some sealer on there. So I'm going to go ahead and rotate this around until it would be about top dead center, furthest point out. And then that way the con rod can sit there and the piston can hang and should be able to not contact that area. Before I go on, I've got one of the gaskets on here and the cylinder just temporarily because I want to address something that was said to me in a porting video. So someone told me that basically my port matching was pointless. There was no reason to match everything exactly. It would actually be better to have the gasket be a little bit larger than the ports in the cylinder and in the case. Because they say that the gasket's going to hang over then, you're not going to get it aligned, and it's going to be worse than having a mismatch. I don't totally disagree with that. I think the gasket just hanging out there would be a bad thing. However, they said that there's no way to align this during assembly. I would disagree, and that's what I'm going to try to show you here. Looking down in where the reeds go, I'm going to try to shine a flashlight in there and get you a closer shot, and we'll see what we can see. So you may have to excuse the flashlight a little bit, but you can see way down here that that is the top part there that I'm touching right now. That is the cylinder. You can see the base gasket there, and then these are the cases. So if you have your reed block out, you can actually look down there and see where everything is. And it would be possible to take something like this pick and move this stuff around a little bit. Or when the cylinder is not totally tight, you can kind of move that around if you need to. But you can achieve a pretty good match. Now, I'm not going to say it's going to be perfect. However, um, if you want to give somebody a hard time, maybe go look up some of the people I've seen that leave a full 3mm mismatch on there. And please tell them about it. At least I am trying. Now I'm going to coat my base gasket with a very, very thin coat of Yamabond 4. And Honda Bond and 3 Bond, there are variations of those that are essentially the same thing or are the same thing. I would kind of prefer to put this on here with nothing and makes uh, disassembly, reassembly, and cleanup really easy. But I just don't trust them with nothing on there, so I'd rather use a little bit of sealant. The more you put on, the more it's going to squeeze out then you really will have some mismatch going on when you've got sealant all over your cases. So use sparingly. And while I'm doing this, I will just say, you know, I just said go complain to the people that are doing a, a three millimeter mismatch. Look, I'm not calling anybody out. Far from it, I don't mean to do that kind of stuff. I'm just saying I put a lot of effort into this. I'm trying to make it match up the best that I know how. Uh, I think it's gonna match up pretty well. And I would be very surprised if many people are going to get an absolutely perfect match. If you're going for a perfect match, then you really should be doing something like installing dowels in here. Like you would put a dowel inside of the block and inside of the cylinder and have a hole for it uh, inside of the base gasket as well. And then if you had, say, two dowels at least, there's really only one way that this can align as long as they're snug. And then you could probably get a perfect match. But beyond that, it's not going to happen. Again, even with this... I'll probably have some uh, sealant hanging over in there. It's just the way life is. But 
yeah, don't take that previous comment as uh, snarky or whatever. I don't mean it that way. Trust me, I make plenty of mistakes. And in fact, I'm going to try and correct one that I made earlier in the last video, uh, later in this one. Um, so yeah, basically just saying, you know, I am giving it an effort here. And I think it'll be pretty close. I'm going to flip this over. Make sure you get both sides. Now I'm going to try to maneuver this over the piston without the piston touching it any more than it absolutely has to and get this onto the studs. And then slide that all the way down against the cases. And this stuff does have some stickiness to it so you can actually try to align your base gasket now and see if you can just push it up there a little bit but you don't want to push the uh, sealant off of the gasket so just be careful. Now I'll squirt a little bit of two-stroke oil in the cylinder and I'll get in there with my finger and rub that all around. I want to make sure the whole bore is coated but I do want to be careful. I don't want to get any of this on the base so I don't want that to interfere with the base gasket seal. And you also want to be careful of the head area. This area I've already got a little bit of oil on there, but that's okay. I can wipe this one down. This one's about to go on right now, so it's got to be clean. And I'll also smear a little bit of oil on the piston. Mostly worried about the ring, but getting the skirts a little bit too. Now to install the cylinder, I need to remember that my exhaust is going to face downward. And I'm going to have to hold onto the piston. I need to make sure that the gap in the end of the piston ring is aligned with that locator that I showed you earlier. And as it goes on, I will have to try and hold the piston ring to compress it against that locator dowel. And that way it will allow the piston to easily slide into the cylinder. So I'm going to kind of hold this from the bottom or sides, get that aligned a little bit and squeeze that together. I'd have to make a small adjustment here in the ring and get that started. Now I'm just going to hold this all up and align it with the studs and the cases and slide that all the way down into place. And then I'm going to go ahead and wipe off the top of my bore real quick with a little oil I got there. You may actually want to use just a little bit of alcohol to make sure that surface is totally clean. And now I'm just going to get the nuts loosely started onto each one of the studs. I'm not even going to torque them at all. I just want to get them just barely touching so I can still move the cylinder. And now just like I showed you before I started this process, I'm going to look in here through the reed area and I'm going to see if I can get the gasket and the cylinder and everything aligned the best I can before I actually start to snug anything down. And whenever i start to get it aligned then i'll just loosely tighten up the bolts a little more so it actually stays in place and i think i may have got pretty lucky because it appears to me that it's mostly aligned now and the gasket's actually still in place where i stuck it so if i hold it in the right spot which is where it is now it wants to align so i'm just going to tighten these down a little bit enough to hold it I'm sure it's not perfect, but it looks pretty close to me, so now I can carry on. I'll start off with a wrench just in a crisscross pattern. I'm going to snug these down lightly. And then I'll use my modified flare nut or crow foot wrench to try and torque these down. And this is 13 newton meters, just like I did it earlier for the mock up. I'll go around one more time, same crisscross pattern. I always like to double check, but also with a crow foot wrench, I want to be very sure that it's not because the crow foot wrench is contacting something instead of me actually meeting the torque. Now that that's secure and I can pause for a second, you're looking into the reeds again down at the transfers. And remember I said you'd have to be really careful because the gasket stuff could seep over the edges very easily and create more of a mismatch than any of the uh, differences in my port matching. So 
if you look down there you can see there's actually a big glob and I think you could probably tell in the video I was as minimal as you could be really when you're using sealant um, but even then there's some in there so to give it my best effort I've got a bit of paper towel secured to the uh, 90 degree end of my pick just got some electrical tape around there so it won't fall off in there and I'm just gonna see if I can kinda dab that up and clean it up a little bit and I'm trying to get top and bottom the best that I could all one all around the sides etc I'm sure there's gonna be stuff that's missed but I'm also sure that you probably aren't seeing other people doing this right now a boost port is the one that's gonna be tricky I don't know if I can get there at all so you may be welding wire to the rescue if I can put the right bend on there I think I can probably get that up there and by the way this piece of welding wire is clean because I cleaned it off when I was trying to make a timing pointer earlier aha now we're getting somewhere Here's how it looks after trying to mop it up a little bit with a paper towel. Definitely not perfect, but looks all right to me and it's certainly better than having that big glob in there. Initially, I was just gonna do a squish check by installing everything and then I was gonna take a piece of solder and kind of bend it so I could put it in the spark plug hole and it could go over to the edge and I could do some checks. But at this point, uh, being the stud mount, the flange mount cylinder, everything on the base is secure so there's no reason I can't do a quick check now. So I've already cut my solder. I'm going to go ahead and secure that to the crown just like before. And I'll do another mock-up with the cylinder head. Torque these to 11 newton meters. Let's see where we're at now. So 0 0.63, 0 0.59, 0 0.6. So my minimum is 0 0.59 and Melosi says 0 0.55 to 0 0.60, so I'm good to go. Now before the cylinder head can go on, I've got more prep work to do. So the first thing is all of these bolts are the same for the cylinder head and the cylinder head cover, and they all have little copper washers in this gasket kit so each one of those needs a copper washer put on there now you should find that there are two row rings of a similar size in the kit there's a green one and a black one the green one is just a little bit smaller in diameter than the black one as far as the actual bore diameter it would work with so I was trying to see which one would fit in here and the black one fit so well that I just went to pop it in there lightly and it's stuck in there like it doesn't want to come out and I'm not going to try and get that out because I don't want to damage it um, you get the idea just like any o other o-ring you're just basically going to start it in there and start pushing it around and you may want to cover that with a light coat of grease now on the other side of this there's a groove here for an o-ring and you'll find an o-ring that should fit it here in the kit so I'll take a very small amount of grease and lightly coat that and you can just kind of work that down there and into the groove. Finally, the cylinder head cover has an O-ring groove that I'm going to hope matches up to this O-ring here, the last thing in the kit that's left over. Very, very small amount of grease. Just kind of rub that all the way around there and into it and then get that situated into its groove. And one thing that I'll say about this Molosi kit, the other kit that I've worked with a whole lot is the TPR 86cc and a lot of times with that the o-rings did not want to sit in there with grease or anything else it could be kind of a struggle just to get the o-rings to stay in there but Melosi is on point with this it has been no trouble for any of these o-rings like I said the other one got stuck in there kind of accidentally um, so they did a really good job with that part so I'll grab the cylinder head make sure this o-ring is in place and then I want Melosi facing up. There's two dots on the top here that will kind of align right in the center. And then 
Making sure I've got my copper washers on each one, I'll go ahead and start all these bolts. Gently snug these. And then I can torque them to 11 Newton meters. So that should complete the cylinder head installation. Now the cylinder head cover. What you're going to find is that this only aligns one way. I thought it was kind of odd at first. It seemed like the Molosi thing should face kind of upright. But I guess it does make more sense if the port is up here. So it's going to be like this. But you'll see if you try to put it on there different ways, it does not align. Also make sure this stays in place. So get that lined up and then there's going to be a little bit of pressure that you got to put on there because you've got this o-ring in here so you got to kind of push it on to pop it on like that you can see it doesn't really rotate much and then you've got three bolts that are identical to the ones that went into the cylinder head so i'll go ahead and get those started and then finish off with the same torque as the other bolts 11 newton meters So that mostly completes our cylinder kit installation. Now I'll install the spark plug and this is the recommended Denso Iridium IW34. I've already checked the gap on here. This is an Iridium plug so it's got a very fine tip. So if you want to check the gap it's supposed to be 28 thousandths and you have to use feeler gauges or something like that. Don't use one of those wedge gauges for spark plugs because that will snap the tip off and if you have to adjust it you grab the ground strap with a special tool. It's got a little hole in it and you're going to pry it basically this way. You're going to use the plug and, and the tool to pry it. You do not pry between the tip there and the ground strap or you will break that. And I'm leaving the ring in here, the compression ring. I will need to remove that before it's actually installed in my scooter because I will use a CHT thermocouple that goes under there. But for now, just to be sure it helps to seal it, I'm going to leave that in there. Normally I will just install a spark plug snug. You kind of get the feel for them because most of us have done so many of these things. But if you want to torque it, something like 20, 25 Newton meters should work pretty well. And the other thing to be aware of with a spark plug is make sure the tip matches what you need. So a lot of scooters, you'll unscrew this tip. It'll basically just thread off of there and you just use the threaded rod that's going through the middle to go into your spark plug cap. Mine, I always use the caps like this. I actually found that they work better for me. So I generally just grab these with pliers and make sure they're snug because sometimes they aren't very tight and they'll come off. Now I'd like to get the reed block and an intake installed on there, but that took a little bit of thought because I did not initially order this as a whole kit. I didn't get the carbon there because I thought I was going to use the 30 millimeter electron that I have for the RC1. If you followed that, um, that hasn't turned out so well. That thing has basically tried to kill everything that I put it on, which is only the TPR86CC, but I've eaten multiple pistons with that. Um, so that definitely needs work, more work and I don't want to just bolt it onto here and ruin this engine uh, or take any chance of it. So I was trying to figure out what I was going to do. I've got a 25 millimeter Del Orto that I use on the TPR. That's smaller than I'd like for sure. Uh, but I thought, well, it would probably work well enough. I could get by with it at the car show, but I'd rather not do that. And I looked into some other carbs. I thought about maybe getting the same carb that Ryan has, which is a 34 millimeter uh, flat slide. And just didn't want to go there because I have this intake. This is the one that says it's for 30 to 34 millimeter uh, carburetors. I bought that extra. It does not come with the RC1 kit. And I thought about it. It's got this sort of diffuser built in. So you can take the one out of here, the stuffer diffuser. You can take it out of the reed block that it comes with. And then this will just fit in there, which is a kind of neat design. Um, but I wasn't sure if I liked that idea. I was going to go with maybe a 32 because I think this is about 32. And it just seemed good, like a good idea to me to match that all up. Now looking at it, this actually isn't even a 28. I thought this was a 28 millimeter kind of match to the carb that they send with it. 
This actually goes down to about 26 millimeters. This ends up. It's a little little bit of an oval, but it's uh, 26 millimeters is what it should be the area of. So I think to me, looking at this, when you check out these intakes, they kind of make the rubber part of the intake turn into an oval as well. And it seems to match up fairly well with this. So it looks like if you use the 28 millimeter with their supplied rubber intake, which I've got three of the things now because you get one with the cases and then one comes with a carburetor kit and Ryan gave me both of his. So now I've got three of those um, and two of the intakes here. But if you use those, um, that turns into an oval when it's squished into here and it appears to match up pretty well to this. So everybody always tells me my carburetors are too small with all of my setups, but I'm always happy with them. So I thought I would just stick with a small side. Again, Melosi has tested this thing. I've seen other people dyno this thing. It can clearly make horsepower with this, even though some people say it might make as much as another horsepower uh, on the top end when you hold it for a while, if you are using a 34 millimeter. But I think I'll be pretty happy with this. If not, I can always change it over later. Before I try to install this, I do want to go over the intake a bit though, because every single one of the rubber parts for the intake, and again, I've got three, Every single one has a lip around here, I guess, from parting or casting or whatever. And it's a real sharp edge, and there's no need for that to be there. So I'm just going to go around there real quick and knock off that sharp edge. I washed this thoroughly and dried it off after I finished. So now the next step is to install the reed block in here. Now the VL18 reed block that comes with this kit is rubberized here. It's got a rubber coating on the reed block, so you're not supposed to have to use a gasket. I'm hoping that's the case. Um, I've had these in the past and used gaskets and sealant before, not the VL18, but others on my uh, Chinese Minarellis, so I hope it works in here. Just gonna lay that down into place. Then I need to get the intake installed into here. So you're basically just going to compress this and try to push it through there, but it's a lot easier if you heat the intake up a little bit. Don't want to get it too hot, it's rubber, but low setting on a heat gun, or you could even use a hair dryer for this, get it at least warm to the touch. You're going to have to kind of fold this over itself. I think you kind of fold it like this, it's the easiest way to do it, and then push it through there, maybe. There it goes. And before I get it seated, I want to figure out how it's going to sit. So I know that my carburetor needs to sit toward the back of the engine. So I can bring it over here. Look at how this is going to fit on the block. So I want it pretty well straight back. I think that's going to put this little parting mark right in the center. So now I can go ahead and get this seated all the way around here. Just push it in. That appears to be as close as it's going to get all the way seated in there. And you can now see that that is oval shaped. It's no longer round there. So it matches up well to this. And actually if I put it up there, you can feel inside of there. And this is one of the areas that they did match up quite well. If you'd like, if you've got a big problem with yours or you think it could use a little adjustment, you can pop this out of there, the little diffuser, and then take that and directly match it to this. But you're going to need to match it to this while it's in here because if you try to match it outside of this when it's not ovalized here, it's not going to match at all. Melosi supplied the four bolts for this. And they also supplied four washers, and every single one of those is rusty, so I'm going to replace those with my own M6 washers. Before I tighten this up, I want to make sure that I get this aligned the best I can with the reed block. Feels good right there. So I'll go ahead and tighten these down in a crisscross pattern. Well, first I'm just going to snug them down with this. Melosi says 10 to 11 newton meters for these, so I'm going to go right in the middle of that at 10 and a half. I'll need to do a pressure or leak test about 24 hours after that gasket was installed, so the sealant has plenty of time to cure. But I've got adapters around for the uh, tester that I made, however, 
even though I can use this for the intake with a 30 millimeter electron, it doesn't fit in here. It's way too small. So I'm going to have to make another adapter for that. I also just realized I shouldn't have installed the exhaust flange because I typically use a uh, plate that will replace the exhaust flange with some rubber on it. And obviously I can't do that with a flange in place. I do this every time for some reason. I'm not exactly sure why. But every time I do a top end, I'll always install this and then realize i got to take it back off. I've got some eighth inch thick rubber here and I was thinking about just cutting this out, punching holes in there and putting this right under the flange and that would probably work, it may or may not, but I've got some aluminum here that's quarter inch thick and I can pretty easily just drill the four mounting holes in that and cut it off so it's close enough to the size. You don't have to make it pretty and make it match this exactly as long as it'll fit on the cylinder. Then I can just attach the aluminum to that and it'll be totally supported. You won't have the uh, empty space here where the port is. So I think that may, be, uh, may lead to a better success rate in sealing and pretty easy. And I know that the adapter for my intake needs to be about 35 millimeters diameter. I've got this aluminum round stock here and it is 38 millimeters roughly. So it won't take too much cutting to make it. I'll just drill a through hole and then I can mount a barb in there, thread it and mount a barb in there, and that's easy enough as well. These are finished up, but I got a couple of notes on these. So if you need an adapter for whatever pressure test rig you have, you don't have to have a lathe like that. You can do it really simple. This was a piece of PVC that I used for another adapter. It would be better if they are not threaded, but this was all I could come up with at a hardware store, I think, the day that I needed this. And you can just drill the end and tap that, put a barb in there. Simple, cheap, quick. For this thing, um, I glued this onto here, the rubber onto there just makes it a little easier. But you will need to take note that the original bolts are not going to work because of how thick that is. So you're going to need another set of bolts for this. So for my test rig, I've just got a Schrader valve on here and that makes it easy to pump it up. I will say that you need to dial your air compressor way back if you're going to do this. Otherwise, it will blast it up to a really high uh, pressure very, very quickly. So I've got mine dialed way back. You can see not a whole lot of pressure in there, maybe 10 PSI. I'm just going to hook this up and try to get it up to about maybe 6 PSI. Now 
Maybe seven. Close enough. Well, back to six. That'll work. And then I just need to make sure that this does not drop any. And I like to give it a half hour. Up to you. Some people just give it a few minutes. If it hasn't moved, then that's fine. For me, um, a half hour is usually what I'll do because if it doesn't move at all in a half hour, then it should be very, very well sealed. At this point, it's been about two hours and the gauge still hasn't moved, so I think it's safe to say it's sealed. So I just need to remove this and put the exhaust flange back on and then I'll be totally done with the top end. And by the way, if you have problems with your leak or pressure test and you want more info on the whole process, I do have an entire video on that and I will link that in the description. As much as I'd like to wrap the video up here with my freshly sealed engine, unfortunately I have some business to attend to. So in my last video about the crankshaft and the gearbox, a lot of people pointed out that I installed the axle seal or the output shaft seal the wrong way around, basically backwards. And they were 100% correct. I have no idea how I missed this when I assemble it and while I edit the video, but apparently wasn't even thinking about it. Thank you for pointing it out. Um, now I get the chance to go in there and fix it. It may have sealed anyway, but it never hurts to go in there and actually make it right. And I definitely wanted to point this out rather than just gloss over it, uh, never mention it again, because I always want my stuff to be accurate and I always want to tell you guys how it really is. So anyway, thanks to that, that wonderful error that I made, now I've got to drain the gear oil out of here, take the gears back out. I'm going to have to do cleanup because I've got sealant on the gearbox cover. And hopefully I can get that seal out of there without any damage, flip it around, and then reinstall everything. I just spent the better part of an hour going over all the gasket mating surfaces with plastic bristled brushes and plastic scrapers and all that sort of stuff, trying to make sure these look basically as good as new. So now I can show you, there's that problematic seal here, the one that I put in backwards. So this is the face of it. The problem is, even though this looks right if you're not paying attention, the face should actually be facing outward. So I need to remove this. I do have seal remover tools, but those are basically little thin hooks and they're pretty good at tearing up seals when they come out. Not always, but I'm going to take a chance that this pry bar with a nice long flat surface gives me a better shot of removing this without having to uh, replace it because it's damaged. So I'm going to be as gentle as possible. See where I can pry this thing out of there. Probably from here. Don't want to damage the cases there, so I'll protect those a bit. Give it a couple pops. There we go. Now I can inspect both sides of the seal. I want to be sure I didn't do any damage to that. It's not hard to bend these things. If you look around there and you see it's like warped or you've taken some of the uh, rubberized coating off of there, or maybe if you look at the back, you may see that the O-ring's not sitting right. And if you see any kind of issue, just go ahead and replace it. But it looks like I got away with it this time. Honestly, the best practice is probably going to be to replace it regardless. All right, so I got a little bit of grease inside there. And I'll just see if I can't get this started. Bearing and seal driver. All right, there we go. So now the seal is in there the proper way. You've already seen me assemble a gearbox, so I'm not going to make you watch that again. Honestly, I've spent so much time in front of the camera. I think I'm probably going to enjoy just cranking up a little bit of metal and putting this thing back together. So I'll get the gearbox back together. At that point, finally the gearbox is done. Top end is done. Everything's sealed up. So most likely next time around, I'll be working on the CVT transmission. 
With that said, I want to say thank you for watching. Thank you to the folks that comment. Um, I probably wouldn't even have caught that seal, sadly, if uh, someone didn't point it out in the comments, and actually many people did, so props to you guys for really paying attention. And subscribe for more, check out the rest of the project, and I'll see you later.